The October 21st planning board meeting is, will come to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> First item, uh, roll call. Doreen, please. Rachel Hendrickson. Here. Rick Mineking. Here. Roger Bailey. Here. Jennifer Ladd. Here. James Siebert. Here. And Bennett Flanders. Here. Thank you. We do have a quorum. Uh, the next item on the agenda is approval of the minutes for September 16th, 2024. Are there any changes, corrections, emendations? Seeing none, uh, will somebody make a motion? So move. Roger Bailey has moved approval. Is I'll, there? I'll second. Uh, Jim Hebert has seconded it. Uh, call the roll, please, Doreen. Rachel Henriksen? Yes. Rick Mineking? Abstain. Roger Bailey? Yes. Jennifer Ladd? Yes. And James Hebert? Yes. Rick Mineking has abstained. He was not present at the meeting. Next item, 4.01, is a consent item. Crossroads Holdings, LLC, is requesting reapproval of their previously approved subdivision amendment number one of the Downs Town Center District, phase two, located at the Scarborough Downs Road, Assessor's Map R052, lot four, for the town. Uh, the Downs is not here tonight. They asked uh, if they could be excused since this was a simple reapproval. Um, so turning to the board, are there any questions? Excuse me, I, I'm sorry. This also is available for public comment. Is there anybody in the room uh, who would like to comment? Anyone online? No. Nope. Public comment is over. Uh, we have a motion. Uh, Doreen, please call the roll. Uh, sorry, uh, I need to read the motion. So I'm going to do that. Uh, you've already approved it, but we also need it on the record here. Findings and conditions of approval. The amendment consists constitutes the second phase of the town center subdivision at the Downs, originally approved as a seven lot subdivision by the planning board in June of 2023. The amendment includes addition of two lots, eight and nine, with lot nine being for a pump station, provision of additional area to lot three, and expansion of lot frontage on lot two. The board finds the project meets the requirements of the subdivision ordinance, zoning ordinance, and approved towns, Downs Town Center master plan with the waivers and conditions below, waivers. The applicant is requesting waivers related to the construction of the Downs Road, which is regulated by Section 701 Town Street Acceptance Ordinance. Sections 5D of the ordinance states design standards herein shall be used for all road and street designs in the town unless otherwise agreed to and permitted in writing by the planning board, unquote. The requested waivers are for one the standard relating to the minimum tangent between curves of reverse alignment, which is required to be 150 feet on Downs Roads. The applicant is proposing 82.1 feet to provide a sharper center line alignment in order to show the slow speeds down along Downs Road. Staff agrees with this assessment and recommends the board waive this standard. Conditions one. The design of Scarborough Downs Road, shown as the shaded portion on the plan, shall be submitted and reviewed by the planning board. At such time, any amendment or addition to the town center subdivision is requested, as well as any amendments or additional subdivision applications that will impact traffic on this stretch of roadway. 
Two, a performance guarantee for the approved design of Scarborough Downs Road, shown as the shaded portion on the plan, shall be in place prior to the issuance of the first certificate of occupancy for any building constructed on a lot north of the intersection of Market Street and Scarborough Downs Road. This would include construction on lot two or lot eight as identified in the first amendment of the town center subdivision, as well as any newly proposed lots or reconfiguration of lot two and lot eight. This does not apply to the pump station plan for lot nine. Three, a note shall be added to the subdivision plan identifying conditions number one and number two above. Four, a note is required to be added to the plan stating streets will not be publicly accepted until a loop connection is made to other public streets. This includes the acceptance of Downs Road being connected between Market Street and the Innovation District Roundabout as one street acceptance process once the Downs Road to the east of Market Street is accepted or Market Street is accepted out to Hikus Parkway. This will assist in operation and maintenance effort by the Public Works Department and provide better planning for winter operations. Five, note 11 on sheet C205, access drive plan and profile sheet shall be modified to provide a clear understanding of the street acceptance process. In addition, such notation shall also be added to the Downs Road plan profiles or the overall subdivision plan. Six, a full plan set for the entire town center subdivision is required including a phasing plan as well as a construction sequencing plan. Separate plan sets for individual amendments will not be accepted. Seven, update the plan set to include the general location at all phases and responsible party for all portions of the proposed trail. Include locations of installation of barriers such as split rail fence or boulders and provide proposed grading to accommodate the new trail. Eight, all wetland areas must be shown on the plan as marked every 50 feet and signed every 100 feet to ensure no encroachment occurs in the field. Nine, address all traffic review comments in memo dated June 3, 2024. Ten, the applicant must provide a performance guarantee in accordance with section nine of the town of Scarborough subdivision ordinance and as noted in condition two above. 11, a pre-construction meeting scheduled through the planning department is required prior to the start of construction activities. A pre-construction meeting will be scheduled once the full plan set for the subdivision has been updated to include the conditions of approval. The subdivision amendment is recorded all fees are paid, an approved performance guarantee amount is provided, and inspection fees are paid. 12, payment of impact fees. 13, provide ability to serve documentation from Portland Water District and Scarborough Sanitary District prior to release of the signed subdivision plan. 14, the pump station proposed on lot nine will require advisory opinion review by the planning board. This shall be reviewed by the planning department. Is there a motion? I so, second. Uh, motion from Rick Meinking to accept, pass. Second? I'll second. Second from Jen. Uh, Doreen, call the roll, please. Rachel Henriksen? Yes. Rick Meinking? Yes. Roger Bailey? Yes. Jennifer Ladd? Yes. And Jim Heber? Yes. It passes. The next item on the agenda is 4.02 advisory opinion. Scarborough Public Library is requesting an advisory opinion for the placement of a 270 square foot shed on the paved parking lot on the side of the property at 48 Gorham Road, assessor's map R059, lot 24 for the town. Thank you, The Zoom link to the meeting is requiring a code, and I'm not sure how to fix that. 
um, if anybody is listening, the code is 876-9265-9678. I don't show any participants. Could you repeat that just in case? 876-9265-9678. We are on the phone with our IT department trying to figure out how to get that code out to folks. So I feel if any of you are here and you have neighbors or friends that are trying to log on, um, they need this code. And I certainly apologize. I'm not really sure why we're having a double whammy of a problem, but I will tell you about the library shed now. Okay. I sure can. It's 876. 876- Nine two six five nine six seven eight. Get it. Uh, the library is requesting an advisory opinion. It's for a two hundred seventy foot square foot uh, shed that they intend to use for their book sales. It's fifteen by eighteen. They intend on putting it in the. Um, front parking off to the side in these two spaces. It would take up approximately two spaces. This is, oh, Angela's driving. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so this is what the shed would look like. Uh, it does show that they have a ramp proposed. We would probably want to um, request that that ramp be a temporary when only in use because it would go out into the driveway. Um, that's it. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Is anyone here from the library? Seeing no one. Uh, is there, uh, are there any comments, public comments? Anyone here from the public that would like to comment? And went online. Well, the comment is over. Let me turn it over to the board. Remember, this is an advisory opinion, so advice, any advice you can give to them uh, in their citing of this and their, well, anything, um, please do so. Jen? Um. I would just question if there is um, an alternate spot in the parking lot maybe for them to store this, even if it was within the same um, arm of parking, if you will, but maybe closer towards the back. And the only reason is because I've seen people parking in this area, like in some of the spaces that they're proposing for the shed space in order to access um, the great walking trail that sort of loops around the municipal campus. And if someone uh, was interested in doing that and had, um, I don't know, it's just the, the most proximate um, parking for that area. So just a thought there. Thank you. Rick? Uh, and well, nobody from the library is here, but my question is, is there gonna be power to this shed there's no uh, there's no, no conditioning or what have you. It's just going to be on temporary footings. Correct. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Um, I I agree with maybe setting it closer to the building, just so it's not so close to the entry where that parking parking lot is. Um, and I concur with the town have a means to get the ramp out of the way so that they're. It's less of a sort of tripping hazard or run over hazard by the vehicles. Otherwise, I have um, no uh, other comment. Thank you. And any other comments? Uh, I, I agree that it needs to be moved uh, closer to the hammerhead, maybe the last two spaces there. Uh, I believe the fire department uh, has indicated it would be able it would be comfortable uh, if it were moved down to the end and, and as a matter of fact, would probably prefer mm -hmm. uh, out of the way. And that uh, I, I concur that it be set up so that the ramp is can be pulled up when uh, it is not in use uh, and gotten out of the way of any any pedestrians or any any traffic that there might be. Do we have anything else, Roger? <clears throat> yes. Um... 
did the, did the library give you any indication why they wanted the location right there? And the reason I asked that is because this is for storage of books to be sold. And I can't recall whether there's a door on the side of the library that moving, moving the location closer to the hammerhead would be closer to a door if there is one there. Otherwise, I could. I it seems to me they put it here because that's a quicker way to get into the library. I, I think if you take a look at the schematic that they gave us, uh, there appears to be a trail, a walking right. path around the library and into the back. Right now, I I, I think there might maybe a door right there on the side. You know. Uh, it, it's I I believe there is, but I which I can't make, I can't actually see that. Which would make relocating it more reasonable. <clears throat> Nothing else. Oh, Ben. Um, I'm just noticing from the the aerial view we have here that it appears to be an ADA parking space near the hammerhead at the end. So if they were to move the shed all the way to the end, that they may have to relocate the ADA space. Is that not what it it's is? It's a cross hatch for the hammerhead, I believe. I don't think it's an ADA space. It, those oh, are around the front. Yeah, okay. Right well, that's the front. good then. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Hearing nothing else, um, Doreen, do you have enough uh, to <clears throat> to construct it? You and Autumn to construct our advisory opinion. Thank you very much. Item 4.03, Sets of Properties, LLC, is requesting supplemental site plan review for the redevelopment of the site for a FedEx freight warehouse and distribution facility. The project is located at 70 Homes Road, assesses map R032, lot 14. For the town, please. July 15th. Um, so at our last meeting on July 15th, the planning board held discussion. There were some concerns with uh, lighting and then neighbor access. The Light Industrial District requires access to the neighboring product, the property down on Two Rod, as no industrial access can be taken off of Two Rod Road. They have amended the photometrics plan. This is a 24 7 operation, so the lighting cannot be turned off for safety reasons. They have proposed a access um, area that could be used if. Um, future development occurs, and that is shown on the plan. So this is the overall site plan. The um, proposed potential, rather, access is here on the plan north side of the site. And they have taken away some spaces in this area, this area, and this area. They are now showing those as phase two. So phase one, um, is in the dark outline and then phase two would come at a later date when they are fully built out. They have also added a row of trees that we have talked about through this process in this area for more screening and more shade to the you know, concrete. The um, for the staff comments, we're just missing a few things. We're missing a bench. Uh, there's a little bit more information that the fire department is requiring for the fire holding tanks. And then we also need a detail for dumpster screening. One thing we did want to make sure to, and I'm sure the applicant can address this, is this where the phased areas are. Oops, sorry about that. What those what those will look like, if it'll just be loam and seed or um, like the rest of the site. So that was just a question. 
We have worked uh, extensively with traffic back and forth several directions. While you all haven't seen this since July, staff and and their traffic engineer and our peer reviewer have seen it several times. And what was submitted on the October 11th letter from Sebago is um, what has been agreed upon for traffic mitigation for this. It includes offsite um, improvements to Holmes Road for frontage. It in includes offsite improvements to Payne Road and Holmes Road intersection. It includes contribution towards future Payne Road intersection improvements, um, and staff has been satisfied with that. Our peer reviewer will give us a final memo stating that. Uh, we've just given him a bit of grace for a family issue, uh, but that will be before you for the next and final meeting. They are still waiting on their DEP approval. DEP did provide a letter, um, but hopefully that will be complete for December. Uh, with that, um, the applicant has a presentation as well. Thank you. And for the applicant, please state your name and function. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Amy Bell Siegel. I'm a senior project manager at Spago Technics. I'm here tonight with Matt Orr, also from Spago Technics, to give this overview of presentation. We have a full house of uh, of uh, let's see here. Hopefully that reads right. Yeah. Okay. So we've got the whole team here tonight. Um, representing um, Setzer Properties, which is the landowner and developer. We have Keith Fryman and uh, AFC Davis. Um, from FedEx, we've got Trina Murphy. Uh, again, Matt and I. Uh, Diane Morbido from Sewell to talk about traffic engineering and answer those questions. We have Isaac Finiak, I don't know if I'm saying it right, um, who's our lighting consultant. And Matt Reynolds from Drumlin Environmental to talk about hyd hydro, uh, geologist, hydrogeology. Uh, and wells and et cetera. And John Cressy from Beacon Environmental. If any questions come to that. And of course, Rick Shanae, our project attorney. So we've got every, the whole team here to answer any questions from the board. So uh, great recap, uh, Autumn, thank you. Uh, we can just you know, show some graphics with a little bit more color on them. Um, and also just to kind of recap from the last substantial submission was on August 19th. And again, that was to be for the September meeting and then we tabled. So these are the topics that were submitted in that more significant uh, submission. Um, specifically what we'll go look at tonight are the phase plan and the offsite improvements, but we can address any of the other topics that we submitted on. Again, the supplemental information, specifically as Autumn referenced with the um, sort of finalization of the traffic uh, en engineering. All right, so that's the, the previous full build out plan. And then as uh, Autumn went through, we've, we're reducing the total parking uh, positions in the yard um, for the phase one. This uh, was the summary that was on that plan. So you can see the difference in phase one and phase two for um, everything from the um, employee parking, tractors and um, yard spaces. with, uh, oh yeah, and so Matt, you can jump up in here. Um, I actually, I'm just gonna go back real quick just to mention, because you brought them up. Um, the the benches will be placed in the patio that is um, to, on the west side of the office space. Um, that space has been on the plan since the beginning. Um, it may be a combination of tables and chairs or benches, but there will be uh, amenities for the employees there. Uh, the the dumpster will be on the east side of the, or well, south side uh, of the main building. It would be screened from Holmes Road um, by the building and by all the landscaping. It'll also be screened from Two Rod Road from all the landscaping and the um, berm and plantings to the kind of south side. So we feel that the dumpster as it's placed adjacent to the building will be completely screened by the building and the adjacent landscaping. Um, and then, you know, so just wanted to point that out. And then just a note here on this rendering too, that the wetland area on the sort of plan right of on the plan there, the blue area, that's sort of the rear wetland um, is about three acres. So as we get into discussions as to, um, you know, how, how might to protect that, I just want to point that out. All right.
Thank you, Amy. Uh, as she mentioned, my name is Matthew Orr, civil engineer at Sebago Technics. Uh, running through some of the uh, traffic mitigation that was agreed upon um, over the course of the last two months. So items that have not changed are the 200 foot left turn lane into the facility on Holmes Road. Um, with this, there will be the full depth reconstruction of the roadway across the frontage. Um, also at the Payne Road and Holmes Road intersection, we are relocating the stop bar uh, on the Holmes Road eastbound approach. Uh, it will move westerly 25 feet, so back from the intersection where it presently is today. Uh, with that, there will be extensions of the um, turn lanes, which requires some widening of the roadway there. We also will be increasing the turn lane queuing storage um, and tapering that's required on home on Payne Road northbound into Holmes Road. Um, this will also require some widening of the roadway in that location. And then uh, some new figures that would have are in front of you this evening and have been submitted in the last couple of responses. Um, one being a $250,000 contribution uh, by the developer for future intersection improvements um, for if Payne Road is ever um, widened, there's some discussion that there will be relocation of um, some of the mast arms and signals that are present out there today and some rework around that. Um, you know, rather than doing those items today and without having a full design completed for that whole corridor, um, this was an agreed upon amount that uh, with staff and through some uh, engineering estimates of cost projected out. Um, this would seem to be a fair contribution. Um, and in addition, the new traffic impact fees that were adopted end of July, so after our last meeting, um, now brings that payment up to a little over $100,000. And just to highlight those items up at a closer scale, so again, this is the 200 foot left turn lane into the project site, um, which you have seen previously. Um, there were no changes there since our last submission. Um, and then this is the intersection work um, that was being talked about with moving the stop bar on Holmes Road um, westerly and then extending the northbound left turn lane onto Holmes Road on the Payne Road Drive. Um, and then also it would be the signals um, in this location and this location that the $250,000 contribution would be put towards. Um, so with that, if there's any further questions, um, Diane Morbido is here from Sewell to kind of go over any further discussion that was had. Um, and as Autumn did mention, um, this has been signed off. We're just awaiting that final review from um, the town's peer reviewer. Um, at that, this time, I think we're ready to turn it back over to the board for any further questions you all might have for us. All right, thank you. This uh, item is uh, subject to public comment. We have received a number of comments. Uh, I'm going to read the names. The text of the comments will be part of the record uh, one from Dave Madden, Elizabeth Grenier, Lisa Bilargian, and please uh, forgive me, uh, actually it looks like Lisa Griffin, please forgive me if I mispronounce your names, uh, Beth Sweltzer, Chelsea Michu, Kristen Barhouse, Lori Baxter, the second one from Lori Baxter, Donna Jackman, uh, one uh, John Anderson has forwarded something from Donna Jackman. and uh, something else from uh, Warren and Denise Hamilton. Let me, um, before we begin 
I'm sorry, there's one more here from Melissa Pelton. Before we begin the public hearing, as a reminder, you have three minutes. Uh, if you have submitted something to us in writing, as I said, we have it, it goes into the record. Um, if you wish to stand up and make an additional comment, please do not repeat what we have, but instead uh, feel free to add to it uh, something that you might have heard tonight or over the last few days prior to, sub uh, after you have submitted this. Um, just a, a word in general as a, a reminder, what the planning board does is ensure that an application meets the ordinances. In other words, we, we don't make a judgment uh, of, of a company. We don't decide we like this company, so let's pass them. We don't like that company, let's not pass them. We can't do that. Under the laws of the state of Maine, we are quasi-judicial. Any appeal from a decision that we make actually goes to the courts, not to the town council. So as we go along, please understand again our role. It's to ensure that the ordinances are met. I'm sorry, could, could you please, if you have a question or a statement, could you please approach the podium and give your name and address? My name is Nicole Hanbury. I live at 322 Holmes Road, and I would, um, I'd like to know who does make the decision. Uh, I, the decision to come to Scarborough and purchase a piece of property uh, is made by a corporation, a developer, uh, and the owner of the property. And that triggers a full review um, in the ordinances that we take a look at uh, to ensure that what is proposed at that site meets the ordinances meets the standards. Um, we have had four meetings already on this. This, I believe, is the fifth meeting. Uh, they have come before the planning board, uh, excuse me, the planning staff. In, in addition, uh, we have um, external peer reviewers who review what's been submitted. And then at the point at which the applicant has completed everything or refuses to do something that we've asked them to do, uh, we take a vote. It's just really unfortunate that something like this is going into our neighborhood. I don't think that- Please please make sure that you're talking into the mic so folks can hear you. I don't think that the infrastructure is there. I think that, excuse my French, but it's ass backwards. You're putting something in that doesn't fit and you know, we're struggling as a community right now as it is to keep up with schools and housing. And now we're adding this gigantic facility. It's very disappointing. Thank you. Denise Hamilton at Two Rod Road and I, um, previously emailed requesting accommodation to speak on behalf of my husband, Warren, and myself as he's unable to speak publicly at this time. Uh, thank you, uh, Denise. And I did have a, a conversation with uh, Autumn about this. Um, Denise will speak for three minutes on her behalf, and then she will speak for three minutes on behalf of her husband, who has is attending in the back of the room. Thank you. I'll try and touch on some points discussed at the last meeting as well as documents provided for this evening. Lighting, we've read the memo where they've indicated for safety reasons, they can't dim the lights at night and that the height of the lights as well as vegetation will not affect the neighbors. Regardless of the berm, the berm and the trees planted on top, I've yet to see any development where trees are planted at full growth. For the berm to fill in will take a decade or longer, and during that time will be a nuisance and annoyance seeing lights from dusk to dawn. 
noise clearly states under the performance standards in the ordinance that the use will not create any offensive noise or vibration to abutting landowners. Have you heard these backup alarms on tractor trailers? Have you heard these alarms over and over again? Can you imagine hearing this 24 hours a day? This is offensive and a nuisance to the neighbors and abutters. Let's face it, there's no getting around disabling them as it's an OSHA safety requirement. Certain boards and committees have gone against the recommendations of long range planning in developing this ordinance. However, there needs to be some common sense used in this situation. Although trucking terminals are an allowed use at this time, this board and this town can say it cannot be a 24 seven operation as it abuts a residential neighborhood. This is not a black and white situation. This town owes it to the residents to look out what's in our best interest, not the developers. Even though freight trailers won't be arriving and exiting on the weekends, they'll be, they'll be moving trailers, which will still have the annoyance of backup alarms all hours of the day and night. Light industrial use. We all still struggle to understand how a FedEx trucking terminal running 24 seven is considered a small light industrial use, regardless of what is in print. This belongs in an industrial park, not a residential neighborhood, but here we are. Not to mention when this project came before this board the first time more than a year ago with a different developer, as well as initially with this developer, it wasn't going to be 24 seven. Then at the last meeting, a slip up was made that it was gonna be 24 seven. What else is gonna to change to negatively impact the neighborhood? and neighbor access. Although my interpretation and research of what an interior lot differs from the town's interpretation, the ordinance under access management and interconnections states their shared use of curb cuts and intersections to reduce the overall number of curb cuts on Holmes Road. It would appear by the map, although not very clear, this access point is on the far east side of the property, whereas the FedEx access point is on the far west side. This is not shared at all, not to mention it appears to be going through wetlands on both properties. Residential water, I didn't see our well inspection report included, but upon inspection with Matt from Drumlin, we have a dug well approximately 10 feet deep. And at that time, which I believe was July, we had about five feet of water. We, along with several of our neighbors, had a meeting with Councillor John Anderson a month ago, and he inspected our well and water level and we had about three feet of water at that time. The fact that they'll be using water that is increased by the number of employees will affect our water levels despite their claims, not to mention their well is about 300 feet from our well. Any development of any sort anywhere in town where water levels are low should be required to pull in public water. Who's gonna be responsible to all our well, if all our wells run dry? Since it doesn't appear from what I've read, they feel they should do anything for us now. We see the developers now being forced to reconstruct the section of Holmes Road along their entire frontage since it's currently a posted road in the spring. Does this mean when Holmes Road gets posted in the spring, they'll have zero trucks coming from the west since it's posted to the Saco line according to the DOT website? And for clarification, I need to know, is the road posting from the bridge or from the beginning of their property? It seems to have changed recently without any road improvements to accommodate the change, which I put into a, put a call into DOT for clarification. Traffic. Anyone who travels Holmes Road and Payne Road know already that traffic is a nightmare, and this project will only make it worse. I see that the stop bar has already been pushed back some with the repaving, and if this gets pushed back anymore, it'll create an even more safety hazard with people running lights at this intersection. As the start bar sits right now, a tractor trailer heading south on Payne Road cannot make a tight enough turn on Holmes Road, as I was just a witness to this while first in line, and we all had to back up. I was also a witness to a tractor trailer heading north making a left turn. Although the tractor itself cleared the first car, the trailer nearly clipped the car, which had to pull to the right. This is already an unsafe intersection, which will only become worse with this project. Two-phase process for parking. They started with approximately 400 spaces. 
And now, according to their two-phase development, the first phase, according to my calculator, has 348 spaces, which is not much of a reduction from 400 for 53 or more, 53 or so employees. Phase two has 467 spaces. So now they have more than doubled their original 400 spaces to 815. They now show between both phases nearly 200 employee parking spaces. Again, how is this a small light industrial project? Does any additional development or added parking go before the planning board again? I'm almost done. Let's talk about public benefit. What we've read, we didn't see anything about public benefit, but more importantly, any benefit to the abutters or neighbors of this project. If anything, it's quite the opposite. If we're wrong, please let us know. Our water, which is needed to survive, will be affected. Our homes that we have all worked very hard for and have made tens of thousands of dollars of renovations over the years will be affected by reduced real estate values by having an industrial trucking terminal in our backyards. The added traffic and safety concerns, as well as the added noise 24 seven and pollution from the smell of diesel are all negatives. These all go against the good neighbor ordinance. What's gonna happen if we're hearing backup alarms before or after the designated hours in the good neighbor ordinance? Who's gonna do anything about it? This isn't like the cannabis ordinance where cops are called, they come out, they smell the stench and it's a verifiable offense. It's going to be a hey, he said, she said, and appears that the developers always win and the residents are getting the short end of the stick. Please put yourselves in our shoes and our homes. And how would you feel if you lived with an industrial complex in your backyard? Everyone who's moved to this area knew what was here and there, and none of us are here because there was going to be a FedEx trucking terminal in our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. It's, is there, is there someone else, anyone else to make a comment? Thank you. I'll be quick. Um, I'm Donna Jackman, 175 to Raw Road. Um, the Beach Ridge is, is in our back door, yeah. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that really concerns me is the water. And I know you've heard it before. Uh, this summer, my husband goes out to check. We have just a point in the ground. It's it's not a dug well. And um, taking the cover off, um, we have sand in the bottom, no water. So, of course, we're taking it very easy now. Um, that is a big concern with us. I, after writing my letters to Autumn and to the council and some of the council members who are up for election. Uh, one of the council members, uh, ans uh, several answered me, but uh, one answered me with the suggestion that she could help me get a loan or some type of, um, uh, so that I could get a loan to have a new well put in. Well, I'm almost 77 years old. I am not about to take out any loan uh, couldn't afford it anyhow. And, uh, you know, I, I just want you to know that, you know, it's, it's harder for us. We've been there 50 years. I want water, uh, you know, and another concern is the noise. Um, I've noticed a lot lately, um, uh, going into my back door yard with the dog at night. Um, I'm hearing the turnpike, like the next door. I, I hadn't, <laughs> heard that a lot before, but I mean, there's that noise and I can't imagine the noise that is going to come from my back door yard. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have anyone else in the room who would like to make a comment? Uh, if you would uh, just uh, head up there and name and address, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Carolyn Williams, and I'm on um, Grapevine Lane off of Holmes Road. Um, this is, I didn't really plan on talking, so I just wanted to hear about everything that's going on. Um, I would like to reconsider this development, but if this is going to go forward, things to consider is, it sounds like $250,000 is not a lot because of all the lights that have to go on. I mean, how much does one light cost, 60000 or more? 
I mean, the lights are expensive. Who's going to have to pay for that in the years to come? I don't think 250 is enough. And I'd like to, if this project is going to go forward, why is this going on and off Holmes Road? We have so much traffic that comes from Gorham, Buxton, Lymington. Everybody uses Holmes Road. If uh, the um, Shaw's has a truck, does truck um, business uh, on Payne Road, and they just go right on and off Payne Road, is there a way, if this has to go forward, that instead of coming on and off Holmes Road, you come on and off Payne Road, somehow go through that back? I don't know. I, I'm not sure of how the whole map works. Something to consider. And she was right. Turning on from Payne to Holmes with Costco there, it's a nightmare. And to have these gigantic... I mean, you went through those slides pretty quickly, but what did it say? Phase one, phase two was like 100 trucks, 200 trucks. I mean, a day, it was crazy what you were just quickly going through. And that's a lot of trucks to going through that intersection. And then just one more thing, everybody on our side is on uh, the other side of the turnpikes on well water. I don't know if everybody knows that. Um, water usage is in something. There's going to be a lot for employees washing the trucks. And that's going to be an issue. Are our neighbors all going to be reimbursed for our wells? That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Is there someone else? Betsy Terrio. I also live on Grapevine Lane, which is off of Homes. I've never been to a meeting before. I wanted to know what was going on. So I came tonight to find out about this project. I moved to Scarborough in 2011. And what was appealing about Scarborough was it was, we had countryside, it used to be farmland on our side of Route 1. It was very appealing, it was quiet. I was originally concerned with the Speedway being there and they were very respectful business owners. You would never know that there was a race the next day that was cleaned up. The parking lot always looked nice and it never hindered us really coming and going out of our neighborhood. And then we allowed Scarborough Downs to go in and Costco. And there has been a ton of clear cutting in a beautiful area, seeing all these trees being dropped in the state of Maine where everybody wants to come and vacation and we're proud to live here year round. It's really sad to see. I know that we're sort of a bedroom community. We should stay that way rather than allowing this plot of land to be paved over and have all these enormous trucks creating pollution at the end of all of our neighborhood streets. It has really impacted us greatly since Costco went in and Scarborough Downs continues to be developed. The traffic is absolutely incredible, and it is not the town that I moved into in 2011. It is a very different place, and I consider every day maybe I need to, to get, get out of here and certainly get out of the Holmes Road area because it's, it's really losing its appeal. So I don't know if anything can be done at this point in time, but here I am with my neighbors pleading our case because th this is not what we want. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Autumn, I sent you an email if you want to put it up. It's the same thing. That's fine. Um, Dan Dickinson, 40 Holmes Road. I uh, live at the salvage yard recycling facility down the street from this project. Um, I want to start with saying, Denise, great job. That was amazing. I'm impressed. Um, I'm, I wanted to go last because, you know, I, 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 I feel for my neighbors. Uh, this is definitely going to be a problem for them. It's going to be loud. Uh, something that nobody's mentioned is the air brakes and the, that's even worse than the backup alarms. So, um, I'm, I'm up here because uh, for a different reason, I, I've, um, 
about the access, you know, th this real estate is going to get developed. 70 Holmes Road is going to get developed. Maybe it won't be FedEx, but it's going to be somebody, and it's probably not going to be to anybody's liking, no matter what happens in there. I have the land behind Beatridge, 50 acres. I'm going to develop that land. There's some wetland there. The, the ordinance requires that the plan developer provide access. I presume that would be by via an easement. It appears on the plan that there's an easement presented. They're dumping it right into the middle of a large, the largest part of the wetland on, on the rear part of the property. So I'm, I'm up here to ask, uh, to, to plead with the chair and the planning department to adjust this easement to at least kick down a little bit so it can go into an area where um, the DEP might actually give me a permit to develop the 50 acres that I have. Um, I guess I shouldn't be a dead horse. I, you know, that's pretty much it. I'm, I'm asking to, let's, can we please adjust this uh, right of way? Uh, it's pretty simple. Um, it's not gonna hinder anybody. And uh, like I said, I got a lot of usable land, even though there's some finger wetlands there. Um, I, like I said, I intend to develop it. I have uh, partners ready to go. And I, I do intend to make applications so we do uh, not run into this new ordinance that's coming into effect for uh, uh, wetland, uh, the environmental standard wetland uh, zoning. I, I can't remember what it's called, but I will beat that. Um, Denise mentioned the roads being posted. Of I operate a recycling facility and we, we crush cars. So we, we run tractor trailers in and out of the property. So we never had posted roads to our property. And it is my understanding that the posted road started after 70 Holmes Road, which would be the office entrance because uh, Beatridge took delivery via heavy truck as well. So my understanding is that the, uh, the posted road started after the office. That was how it was always played. Um, you know, I, I grew up here in Scarborough. Uh, you know, I, I, I spent some time in Gorham, but I grew up in Scarborough. I spent my time at this salvage facility. I learned how to drive there when I was five years old. Uh, the reason why I'm telling you that is that when, when the zone changed in 2013, I got really excited because I wanted to develop the land. I got excited because I thought that maybe someday I could buy Beatridge Speedway and keep it operational and develop the rear lane, which I now own. So I've been working on this for a long time and uh, I, I hate to see um, this get shot down, but at the same time, I do feel for my neighbors. Um, the, the, the uh, sorry, I'm kind of bouncing around here, but at the end of the day, this land will get developed and I, I ask that the that the you know, the chair to assist in getting this right of way changed. Um, and um, one other aspect would be is that there, I think there should be a moratorium on the environmental standard zoning uh, rule that's coming, because I have been working for a long time, again since 2013 and before. To, to get acquire this land and to develop it. And now all of a sudden, I'm probably not gonna be able to develop it if I don't get my application in time and having uh, FedEx and, and Setzer figured out on this project. If I don't get the access, I don't get to develop. So it's, you know, it's unfortunate, but uh, I, you know, I'm all for the project, but I'm not for the noise. So thanks for your time. Thank you. Uh, I, I do have to um, say that the chair does not have the authority to change the easement. Uh, I would recommend that you go back into negotiations with the, the FedEx folks or with Setzer uh, to see if it's possible to change the access to what you are proposing. Uh, uh, I simply don't have the authority to do that. Um, that's 
all subject to negotiations between the uh, between the two two parties. I, you can step back. I'm not sure there's okay. anything I can do. Uh, just the 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 let's just say the negotiations have been slow and communications have been slow and n not the same. I'm sure that they're very busy people, but. Um, the you said it yourself as you said that there can be an easement but it doesn't have to be a good easement well what's the point the zoning was written to have the ability to develop this rare land so the the power is in the planning board to approve or deny this plan if they approve it with this terrible right of way it, it's what's the point I have a comment I'm going to refrain from making. Um, is there any of any else who would like to make a comment? Thank Hi, you. I'm Richard Colton. My property abuts that the project. Um, speaking about the, the noise ordinance with this, I raced over that racetrack for years. We were made to run mufflers. It was one night a week, maybe two. You know, in the lighting, that was... 10, 11, or 12. it was later on, earlier in years, as years went on, more developments were made, you know, more residents, the lighting was gone at midnight, shut down. And now this is like a 24 seven thing they're proposing. That don't really meet the ordinance in my eyes. And the water too, they gotta do something about it. These people, they don't wanna do nothing for anybody. They have, none of this whole project, they will do nothing for the residents in this area. You guys have asked, other people have asked. They have never commented on helping anybody. Thank you. Uh, I have been uh, corrected uh, in terms of what has been submitted. There is also an email from um, Joseph Griffin. I noted uh, I noted a different Griffin. Uh, they're also from Joseph Griffin. So that will go into the record as well. Is there anyone else? I, is it a rebuttal or? This, this, this is, um, this is not, this is not what's before us tonight. So it's a perfect, perfectly logical suggestion. I would suggest that you Talk to Mr. Kinneman. All right, I, uh, I've uh, been requested by Autumn that she be allowed to make some uh, comments that would correct the record uh, from the prior conversation, from the prior um, public opinions. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify the parking table for phase one and phase two. It's cumulative in phase two. So it's not separate. It's, is that correct? It's phase one, they will do the 42 truck docks. And then when phase two is complete, they'll have 62 truck docks, not 104. Okay. I just wanted to make sure I could see how you could read it. I just wanted to make sure it, you all realized it was cumulative. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm a little bit at a loss. We usually would go to the board comments at this point. I would like instead at this point to ask the applicant uh, if they have um, comments uh, to uh, explain the facts. In, in other words, explain uh, what they've done and uh, what is going to be happening on that site? Uh, anything from what the folks have have said is uh, Autumn issued a correction in a sense that um, no, there's not going to be 800 parking spaces because it's cumulative. Is there anything that was stated that Setzer would like to correct? We 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 have we have a whole crew of really talented and impressively educated folks here who can talk about all of these subjects. Right, I mean, it, um, 
We certainly can respond to specific questions. Um, I can bring up Matt to talk about wells. We can kind of go through that. Matt Reynolds to talk about wells if we want to kind of go through that in that way, depending on how the board wants to move. Um, well, oh. Yeah. I, I just want to make sure. I'm, <laughs> okay. I, you know, that's, that, that's fine. There was so much information that, that uh, came out that if there was anything that you could correct, if there's a misunderstanding that we can deal with right now before we go to board comments. Otherwise, the board's going to ask you the questions anyway. All right. Well, I'll jump in with a couple things because I did note a few. Um, so one uh, would be around um, claiming that the, the site is going to have more pavement um, than previous. That's, that's, not, that's not actually the case. Um, overall, we're going to be redu reducing the amount of impervious surface on the, on the parcel. Um, right now, the land doesn't have any treatment for stormwater. And obviously, as you know, we are um, proposing both infiltration and a gravel wetland. Uh, we will be extensively planting the site um, uh, along Holmes Road, along Two Rod Road, preserving all, um, all the mature vegetation along Two Rod Road. We are installing the berm that's 8 to 12 foot in height along the abutters. Um, and that specific height and the vegetation there is des was uh, designed as a result of the sound study that was done that we submitted previously, um, that 8 to 12 foot in berm height is the height that is required to mitigate the sound. The vegetation on top of that is uh, more of the buffer. So when the, the comment about it, you know, uh, maturing over time is true. Obviously, we're not planting 24 foot trees, um, but they will be in the range of six to 10 feet in height. And there'll be a variety of um, evergreen and some fast growing deciduous trees in there too. So I totally, you know, understand that's not an immediate visual buffer, but that eight to 12 foot high earth berm will actually attenuate noise. Um, as, as previously submitted in the sound study. Um, let's see. This is a conforming, I mean, this is an allowed use in this, in the light industrial. Um, I'm not sure if there's, I don't know. Uh, there'll be no washing of trucks on site. That was another comment. There's no, um, there'll be no wash bay. Um, let's see here. The total amount of trucks daily will be somewhere between 30 and 34 inbound. I think it was some large number that was cited pri previously. Um, the the two hundred fifty thousand um, dollar estimate that was going towards the improvements to the intersection that was based on a conversations that with um, the town's peer reviewer, traffic engineering, and Diane can speak to that more. Um, let's see here. I don't know if Matt, there's anything I've got much, but. Um, placement, oh, uh, two access shared curb cuts. Like we have an emergency access that's coming off of Holmes Road um, along where the existing curb cut is to go to the office. That will be the access in emergency access into the side of our parcel. That's also where we're putting the 50 foot right of way to um, the Butters property. So there is a shared um, curb cut there. Um, yeah, I don't know if where's. All right, thank you. Um, Autumn, I asked you to, if you could, uh, either you or Angela comment uh, about traffic and uh, corner of panes and homes. Sorry, I'm sorry, Chair. Could you repeat that question? No, I'm asking Autumn. Oh, sorry. I heard to Angela. <laughs> okay, Angela. Uh, so I take, uh, maybe I'm jumping to assumptions. What we're talking about is um, what, is to come in that intersection as I think so yes. people had brought up Payne Road and anyone who's driven out there seeing obviously increase in traffic on Payne Road and that intersection in particular. Um, the Downs actually is part of their traffic movement permit to do the improvements that you've seen so far on Payne Road. Um, there is more traffic that they will be generating to essentially you're supposed to do the mitigation and then your trips catch up with it. I think what you're seeing is the trips are catching up very quickly um, and there's more to come before their next TMP gets triggered. And so we're already looking ahead at the next downs TMP because of the traffic that's being generated in that area. Um, and- uh, Just a moment, a TMP, traffic okay. movement permit. Yeah, and that is through the state. That's a DOT permit, um, which the original 
traffic movement permit did come through this board um, had a chance to look at it review it um, I think we made a couple comments or tweaks the board can be a little more restrictive and I think they added maybe a right turn lane or some other widening there were a couple of things I think you guys added to that mix um, so what comes with the next um, traffic movement permit with the state is frankly that intersection is going to get bigger um, we start talking about additional through lanes, additional turn lanes, um, which means some of the mast arms that are in that location have to move. So where the pole uprights are with the mast arms for the signals get moved out so that you can accommodate more lanes. It's, it's, it's going to get bigger. There's no way around it. Um, and I think that was uh, traffic engineers from the original master plan that I think the planning board saw, and if you, some of you were here at the very beginning, those master plan, there's some pretty jaw-dropping graphics that came out of that is looking at what, what really the end product, once we get all the way down the road, it's a lot of traffic and how do you mitigate that much traffic? Um, so that's where we were looking at, do we do it now? We start doing these little incremental improvements where we don't have the plan completely you know, um, set in stone, there's a lot of moving pieces that could happen, right? There's changing in development patterns or transit or lots of other things. And so do you, do you ask an applicant to say, move it, things in a certain location to improve that intersection where five years from now, we're, we're playing um, Monday morning quarterback and saying, oh, if I'd only moved it five more feet or we didn't really need to move it, maybe if we, snuck it a foot or two this way. So we thinking through that, does it make more sense instead for them to do work, kind of put it towards a future project. So they're kind of looking at future mitigations of that intersection um, because they are impacting the intersection. I think we've heard that. Um, and I, I don't think we're um, bearing a head in the sands when it comes to that. I think we really, to get trucks through there, there's gotta be improvements and there's substantial improvements that need to be made. And that's what we kind of laid out. I think Matt um, from Sabeo kind of laid out some of those things that might be one bullet line, but they're not as simple <laughs> as, a, as a bullet line. There's there's a lot of work. There's a lot of money. There's a lot of infrastructure that goes to, say, adding um, a few hundred feet in a very congested area in a, in a congested corridor. So. Um, so that was, I think, around the TMP. I also, while I had the the mic, if you don't mind, I'd like to actually address, um, I think there was some questions around road postings. And I think um, I can speak to a little bit on the confusion on that. Um, so in the past years, there's a couple of things. Um, the town of Scarborough has always posted Holmes Road from 40 Holmes Road, which um, I think is Mr. Dickinson's property to the Saka line. Um, last year, because of the warm temperatures, we didn't have the frost heating. We had no road postings in town. I will say the DOT website conflicts that. Um, their website shows that Scarborough's um, was from the Beechridge Speedway to Saco line. So it's in that general area. Um, I think what happened when, I think Anam had mentioned in a previous meeting when we first sat down with FedEx, um, we talked about the road postings, one of the first things I brought up and making sure that we had um, structural integrity of the road in order to handle these trucks. And so we actually started talking about, do we need to rebuild the road um, from two rod all the way back to Payne Road? And that was our initial conversations. Um, with that, we asked for a lot of um, some analysis on it. They did some borings um some pavement cores things like that to figure out what's under that road how structurally sound it is and that was led through our public works director um and he was went out to the site too with them and they went through that information and got to a point where you can definitely see if you drive out there there's a line in the pavement where there's newer pavement and the older pavement which is essentially their frontage um the 70 homes road frontage is the older pavement. And so that's the area where it, it appears that Holmes Road was improved to some level um, from say our, Mr. Dickinson's lot or right next to it is, is the town's transfer station. 
all the way back to Payne Road has had some improvements over the years, um, but it appears nothing has happened beyond that. And so that's where we um, had it in our conversations with FedEx about looking at um, doing a full depth reconstruction of that section of road. So that would get us into a point where we would not need to post the road from two rod back to Payne Road in the future. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm going to declare public comment closed and we're going to turn to the board. Um, I think I think the board will have a fair number more questions uh, that um, perhaps we'll get some more discussions some more explanations. Uh, Roger. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> can, can we have the hydrologist expert and, and we can indeed. Okay. And good evening. I see you were all prepared. Well, there we go. Um, <clears throat> from the very beginning of this project, um, the wells of the residents has been an issue. And I, you recall that you folks did some testing out there. We did, yeah. I think with a couple of wells or something. Yeah. Can, uh, can you give us um, any sense of assurance of the residents? I know you guys are going to go down like 300 feet or something like that on your well. So let me let me sort of provide some context. And a lot of this is included in an August memo that we provided with a package to the to the town. But basically, so so for context, um, as as Amy said, the there's not a truck washing facility. So it's really bathrooms and sinks and so forth. And the the project will use about 1200 gallons a day of water that's based on the, the the plumbing code if you will and for context that's about equivalent if there was a residential development on that 50 acres if you put five three bedroom houses on that 50 acres so ten, five houses on 10 lot 10 acres each you'd use about the same amount of water so just to help you the, the context it's it's not for a 50 acre parcel of, of property it's not a lot of water in in the in the grand scheme of things um i, I totally understand the residents concern and a lot of that is because of the nature of their wells they're very shallow they're susceptible to drought conditions they've been made worse i believe by the development across the across two rod road which has a large stormwater under drain that I think has lowered the water table in those in that area. Um, but for this project, what everything has been done to minimize the risk to those wells. And so there's several things. First of all, the, the project well is gonna be a deep well in bedrock. So there's their wells are shallow. This project is gonna draw water from deep in the bedrock. There's quite a thick soil horizon, which includes some fine grain material. So they're going to be as isolated as possible, maybe not absolutely isolated, but they'll be quite isolated from the shallow wells. Um, and the again, the water the water use is is not large in in the grand scheme of things. So in addition, the stormwater system that, that's that's being added, infiltrates a lot of that stormwater back into the property. So instead of running off and going somewhere else to the extent possible, a lot of that stormwater is helping to recharge and maintain the local water table. So again, there's there's been a number of components that have been included to try to minimize the risk that's posed to these to the neighbors' wells. I absolutely understand their concern. I think that the risk to those wells is low. Um, because of these factors and because of just the overall size, the overall water use in relation to the size of the property. That's sort of an overview. If there's a specific question, I'd be happy to try to answer it. No, that's good. That's good. Thank you. Um, um, from the very beginning, uh, this project, I mean, except if you accept the fact that this is the ordinance says they could, they could do this right there. Okay. Um, and I know some of the residents don't, and I do empathize with the residents who are there, who live there. <clears throat> but from from my 
viewpoint, unless I missed something, almost everything we've asked this applicant to do, you know, whether it was sound mitigation uh, with the berms and the, and the um, vegetation above the berms, or all the traffic. I mean, there's a lot of traffic improvements that we've asked for. And um, unless there's something that we've asked for that they said they're not gonna do, I, I'm not aware of anything myself. Um, I do have a question for Mr. Dickinson though. Yeah. Could, could, would you mind going up there again? Um, I tend to agree with you. I don't. I don't see where there would be much harm for them, for the applicant to, uh, you know, deviate their access to your property. You know, and I'm kind of curious. Do you have any sense that they would? They're resistant to doing that. No. Uh, You're still in negotiations with them, and uh, my understanding is that the ordinance requires provision, provide access. It tells me that there needs to be an easement at the closure of this uh, of this uh, application. This is a plan development. They're supposed to provide access. It should be on the plan. It should be there available for when I am ready to develop. Um, there has uh, been negotiations of purchasing sale uh, obviously that's private, but um, that has going very slow um, and it's changed three times. So I'm, I'm a little um, miffed about it because, you know, I'd like to pr proceed and move on with my project. I'm happy to buy some land and move forward and do it the way I want to do it. But at the same time, th the ordinance requires providing access. And on top of that, as Denise pointed out, we're supposed to be sharing access. One curb cut, not three or not two. And I don't understand why this wasn't set off from the beginning that the, you know, the, the idea that the, the rear land would be developed. And so if we're gonna develop the front, we get a plan for the rear too because the ordinance was written that way. I was there in the beginning and I planned for it. So that's why I'm kind of fighting for this access to be the way that it should be. I bought this land knowing that they bought that land and that I would get the access I needed to develop the land. I presume that there'd be an easement provided that the planning board would approve a plan for Setzer with an easement available for me to access. Of course, I will develop the road and improve the road and, and invest in the road, but the access should be provided not me have to buy it. The, or, that's, the ordinance is clear, in my opinion. Okay. But, all right, let me, let me ask staff a question then. Um, I, I think when you first came before us, you know, a few meetings ago and, and talked about this, wasn't there um, in the original, in some original plans, there was an easement for this access to this property? Or was there nothing official? No, this is the, excuse me, this is the first set of plans that the access, the potential access has been shown. No, be, uh, before this whole, this whole development, you know, when Beach Ridge owned, owned the property, was there a, was there, there was no easement then? No, okay. no but there was a, an existing curb cut. So there were, were actually two curb cuts for that property. And that's the proposal that remains uh, with a curb cut, the, a shared curb cut, the access uh, to the rear of the property and to the uh, emergency entrance for the fire department. So that's, that's shared on the one curb cut uh, and it parallels, it looks as though uh, it, it shares the street with the, uh, um, with the access to the rear. Uh, but what had happened is the um, the Setzer had shown the emergency access, which came off of Holmes Road uh, in the pretty much the same place as this starts as this 
rear access starts and then turns into the property. What I'm getting at is, um, does Mr. Dickinson have any any rights to access his property? Uh, is there anything on the town? Not currently. Okay, because I think I thought it, at one of our earlier meetings, you said there was something in writing. It would be in the, the ordinance that I was referring to, the light industrial in ordinance. That's what I'm referring to, that, that the plan developer of 70 Holmes Road, Setzer, is to provide access in the process of the plan development application. Okay, which so, which set, Setzer has agreed to. Yeah, yeah a, okay. there's so, nothing that says what it looks like, I, I, but the okay. access oh, would okay. be there. So the, the only question now is, is you're, you're negotiating that those two different options at the tail end going into your property. We're, we're I don't know where we are. We're, we've gone from one idea to, to a second idea to a third idea, and I'm, I'm a little lost. I'm not getting the communication that I would hope for. And at the end of the day, whether I, there's a land purchase or not, when this plan development is approved, I would expect that there'd be an easement access shown on the plan that is viable to develop the rear land. It's as simple as it, you know, and that's why I'm standing up here. It's why I provided the, the, the graphic. The, the second page is my opinion of what it should look like to, to dump the, ax, uh, the, the easement into an area where there's open land that's not wet. Um, you know, I don't want, uh, the, uh, nobody wants to see wetland filled in Scarborough anymore. As uh, in the past, that was a practice. But there's some viable land. There'll be some crossings. Uh, but I, I, I don't want uh, the right of way to be dumped into the largest part of the wetland. It, it is big. And I'm just asking that planning, the chair, all recognize that, you know, he, he, the chair mentioned that it doesn't have to be a good access. But Again, I ask, what's the point of putting the right of way into the middle of a largest wetland that that doesn't meet the ordinance? Like Rick Meinking said, do no harm. It's not following the ordinance. So, so basically, this is a negotiation between you and, and the applicant. As far as the land purchase goes, but again, I'm asking for a right of way that should be on the plan development which is part of the ordinance. It shouldn't have anything to do with land purchase. There shouldn't be a question of purchasing land or not. Autumn had mentioned that, that it's a, something that, ne that needs to be negotiated between the, the Setzer and I, which I'm happy to do and I'm happy to buy some land. Trust me, I love to buy land, but it's going slow. And when this plan development is approved, whether we buy land or not, or whether we negotiate or not, I want the right of way shown on the plan, so no matter what happens with our negotiations, that I can access that, whether I buy land or not. All right, I, 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 I hear what you're asking. Um, I don't think this is something that we can immediately make a decision on because it is subject to negotiation uh, between the two parties. We will have at least one more meeting on this. Uh, I urge you to work with Setzer, and I urge Setzer to work with you to determine um, what exactly the access would look like. And then we can, uh, if there is an agreement between the two parties, that there is a right of way, an easement. Uh, we routinely do put easement notices or easement signs um, on plans. But you two have to come to an agreement. So um, we can't get in between you. We can't mediate it. Uh, if SETSA provides access, it's there, whether you, whether you like it or not. It, as I've said before, there's nothing that in the ordinance that says the access must be X amount. Right, but you it, have the power it, to, to make that adjustment. No, we do not. So what I'm saying is it's the subject of negotiations. 
if you come back and Setzer comes back and both of you say, okay, we've agreed, here is the easement. We don't need to know if you paid for it or didn't pay for it. We don't need to know what the negotiations were. We need to know that the two of you have reached an agreement that here is the easement and the access that we've agreed upon that goes on the plan. And then it's all, as I said, it's, it's between the two of you, two parties. We, we are limited in our authority. The, the ordinance says they provide access. It doesn't say they provide free access. It doesn't say that they sell it. It doesn't say that there's an easement. Uh, it doesn't say it starts and ends in a wetland or it doesn't start and end in a wetland. It simply says that they provide access. I don't think it should end up in the middle of a wetland, but that's my opinion that has actually very little to do with the ordinance. So again, we, and this becomes, this is one of those difficult times. We may all have our opinions about the access, but we have to go with the ordinance. I'm telling you what we can't, what we can do and what we can't do and what your way forward could be. Uh, and we will have, I believe uh, we will probably have a meeting uh, in December with um, sets are coming back to us. That's I think uh, the, the thought. Uh, so I, I'm sympathetic with the fact you have uh, investment partners that would like to move really fast. Um, it's, it's just a matter the of ball, the balls in your court and sets his court on this access. And of the shared access and the shared curb cut. The, the shared curb cut, they are required to provide a curb cut. There is a curb cut there. As a matter of fact, it is shared. It, it looks as though, at least on, on your map uh, schematic, it looks as though it shares the space with the um, emergency access that sets are had for the uh, fire department to the um, east side of the property. The so the, that would be shared. The yeah. ordinance was written so that one road, it would be an industrial park, one road in, run out. There, there were already two roads in. There were already two curb cuts. They were, but the new so, plan development so should that's be one. Grand, that's grandfathered. In other words, they, it's still within the ordinance. I can understand that, but it's still okay, a new development. I, now, I, we are not going to get into an argument, okay? I'm not. Okay, so I appreciate uh, I appreciate your thoughts. If you could please take your seat. I see uh, Mr. Cheney has got his hand up. I'll ask him to stand up and approach the podium. Thank you, Madam and Chair. I'm, he's an attorney. You can tell me if I'm doing something wrong. I would not ever give you advice on how you handle these. Go ahead. Try it, Rick. Uh, Rick I won't. Uh, Rick okay. Cheney with Drummond Woods. So I represent the applicant. I just want to, it's important that words be properly stated in red. This section of the ordinance does not say that the applicant must grant an abutter an easement through the property. What it does say is plan developments, which this is, shall make provision for street and driveway interconnections to the rear properties. My client's not going to grant an easement to Mr. Dickinson until the project is approved. There's no point in doing that if there's no approval for this project. What my, my client has done is shown on the plan that's before you tonight, the location of where that road would go. And it's along the east side of the property, utilizing the existing curb cut that will also be the point of emergency access to this project. Now, whether that arrangement with Mr. Dickinson ends up being an easement or perhaps he purchases that strip of land, my client has been talking to him about that. But we're not required to give it to him. It's a negotiation, as the chair has said. And 
my client has been reasonable in these discussions with Mr. Dickinson and should the project receive approval, we will do our best to provide Mr. Dickinson with access to his property over the area that is already shown on the plan. So I just think it's important that people understand that the ordinance doesn't say my client has to give Mr. Dickinson an easement. It talks about making provision for access and we're doing that on the plan. Thank you. Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Autumn would like to weigh in. Go ahead. Just to that same point, I also want to point out that if this plan gets approved and access is given, Mr. Dickinson will also have to come back with his site plan and show traffic impacts on that driveway. And there's potential that he would have to do improvements to that intersection as well. I just want that to be really clear. Um, just because he gets access there, he may have users that require a traffic movement permit as um, our town engineer talked about. So I just want you all to understand that too. Thank you. Uh, Roger? Yeah, just one last thing. Um, I wonder if the applicant would um, be willing to address the issues raised by Mrs. Hamilton's um, discussion about, you know, when she was holding up her phone and the um, the backup alarms and everything. Can you give a give us? Do you have any any response to that? Don't be afraid. We don't yell. Could you speak to the sound study, maybe, and yeah. then the actual timing of the vehicles? I think yes. you have uh, Keith Framman. <laughs> so the purpose of this is we do know that there is going to be noise there but from the backup alarms, but it's intermediate. It's not continuous. It's not 24 hours a day like Denise has proposed. Um, that's why we are doing sound barriers. We've done a sound study. Those guys know what they're doing. We've had them all over the country. We've done these all over the country. This isn't our first time doing a sound barrier. And it mitigates the sound. So, I mean, I understand her concerns, but we are mitigating the sound to the best of our abilities given the practices that exist today. They don't, again, they are not 24-7 just beepers going off. They're maybe six at a time for like two hours, and then you might have one or two in the yard. Those things are intermediate. So. Okay, I'm, I'm all set. Thank you. All right, Roger's all set. Do we have somebody else? Jen. Um, just on the, to follow up on the easement conversation, you know, I think that um, we hear and see a lot of different easement um topics or issues or whatever opportunities, maybe if that's how you want to look at it on, di on different parcels. And I guess I will just say that, you know, I under, I understand the, and appreciate the clarification on sort of the legal interpretation there. Um, but I would, I would ask if, um, if this applicant could, regardless of if it's Mr. Dickinson that purchases and develops this uh, back property, or it could be someone else, who comes forward to your team later uh, requiring an easement access to that parcel that that both parties work to just limit the wetland impacts period and um and you know i'm not a i'm not gonna uh, measure off you know what the wetland impact is based on the alignment that we're seeing right now versus what that would look like if it was angled slightly but I'm familiar with plan reading and my guess is it would be less um, if if the easement was angled a little bit and also that that probably wouldn't burden in some cases in some other parcels that might burden the developable potential for another part of this land um, but because it is sort of in the corner that doesn't seem highly likely to me and so um, I think just in the interest, like again, like regardless, regardless of any other abutters or developments, I think um, you know from a wetland standpoint, we'd all be better served to limit those impacts um, to the extent possible. Um, that's all I have to say about easements. Um, um, I do have some questions about. Um, oh. Uh, there was a 
some documentation and a question, I think some outstanding information for the fire department about um, cisterns or water storage on site. Is that right? Did I read that right? They uh, wanted to make sure they had the right um, code requirements for the state fire marshal okay. review of that fire system in the tanks. Um, I cannot recall this from prior uh, presentations by the applicant, but I am curious if those cisterns are to be filled by way of the proposed wells on site or if they will be filled by a pump truck or water otherwise brought in. And I ask that um, in, you know, with, with regard to the abutters that have come um, with concerns for their own well water. And I understand, um, and I think the, the water usage proposed for the site, those calculations are very helpful for context, but um, filling sort of one, even one time filling of fairly large uh, cistern tanks. I was just curious if that was intended to be done um, from well water or brought on site. Uh, so speaking to that, the, the underground cisterns will be filled from a tanker truck that's brought in offsite on the first go around. Then that system will be um, hooked up to the, the onsite well system. So if there ever is a draw or there are levels that drop below what is sufficient and required by code, um, you know, there will be float sensors to top that off um, over time. But initially, yes, the system will be filled by off-site water sources. Um. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. Um, the, let's see, okay, um, on to traffic. Uh, the off-site mitigation plans that are proposed, well, actually first, I'm gonna start somewhere else. Um, the last notes that I have from this project um, included some questions about um, you know, not just trip generation from this facility, but trip distribution. And, you know, I think we've heard it from some of the uh, neighbors here tonight. Um, we definitely got a full dose of it by way of um, emails sent to the board from the public. And I've even heard it from like other people. I don't usually get a lot of personal feedback from things on the board, but um, I've had friends, you know, ask about this, like, whoa, the traffic out there is so bad. How could we possibly handle this? Um, and I have some level of understanding about how this will be handled. And so um, I don't pass this on lightly, but I do have concerns about, you know, when we typically talk about trips, we're talking about, um, a, a, you know, a regular passenger vehicle trip or queuing, you know, we look at eight cars queued or 20 cars queued or whatever that is. Um, and I don't recall the lengths offhand, but you know, if the original proposal was to um, include hundred foot long left turn lanes, um, you know, that's, that's a relatively short number of tractor trailer trucks versus regular um, passenger vehicles. And so I'm curious if we can provide any information to the public and, and even for the better, you know, for the education of the board, you know, how, how can we be assured that, um, you know, I, I guess I'm looking for the difference between, between talking about trip numbers and, and physically what that means in terms of um, particularly queuing at, uh, at Payne, Payne and Holmes Road in particular. Um, and I, I see, um, I looked at the, you know, the offsite mitigation plans proposed for that intersection. It didn't look like there were any right of way lines on it. And so another question that I have regarding that is whether or not there will be any wetland impacts associated with those lane lengthenings or easements or right of way needed to accommodate those plans that are proposed. Um, we can start with the trip generation numbers. We based this on the existing facility in Portland, multiplied it two and a half times because this is gonna be a larger building area. The AM peak hour 
of FedEx itself, which is not the same peak hour as adjacent street, is a total of um, 41 trips in an hour, 27 entering and 14 exiting. And that's at initial operations. We brought this out 20 full years to a full build out. That comes to 52 trips at build out. This project does not require a TMP. There are not large numbers. Um, at initial occupation, so we had 55 PCEs. So that means we had a peak hour of 14 trucks in a peak hour. And that would be some coming and some going. And so there are not a lot of numbers at, at Holmes and the it, improvements at Holmes Road. Um, Sebago did look at that. There's a lot of right of way there on that northwest side. So there is right of way to make those improvements. Okay. Um, I don't know if you have it handy. I don't recall off the top of my head, but I'm curious what the peak, the AM peak hour is that you're looking at. Um, these were from the counts that we did. So the AM peak hour of that's of the generator itself of FedEx, which is not necessarily the same peak hour as the adjacent street. So it's, I think it's the peak hour for FedEx was actually later. It was more like eight to nine or okay. nine to 10 versus seven thirty to eight thirty, something like that. Okay. So the hours are offset slightly. Okay. Um, thank you. That's helpful. Um, can you speak to the difference in length between um, these type of trucks and well, there are your average passenger vehicle? And I, I understand the actual difference in length, but in terms of what that means for um, queuing and, you know, particularly, I know that at someone, there was a communication from someone today that was talking about queues on Holmes Road, um, approaching Payne Road, backing up to the, to the bridge yeah. Again, um, the, today. The truck numbers are small and the analysis we did use those truck numbers and a high percentage of trucks to make sure that the queue storage, you know, we modeled that projected it. That's where that extra 100 feet of storage was determined to be more than enough. And then the extra 25 feet on Holmes Road. Okay. I mean, when you spread five or six trucks out over the course of an hour, it's one every 10 minutes. It's mm -hmm. not multiple trucks Lines. at a time. Okay. Um, another question that I had previously was about, um, uh, you know, you're you're looking at your your traffic modeling is looking at this facility as sort of an an end destination or starting destination, and you're modeling your own traffic, um, as you should. Um, and early on, you know, we have had a lot of these meetings. Early on, I think there was a, there was a lot of comments from um, residents on Two Rod Road and and elsewhere about uh, concerns about truck traffic on some of these other roads. And I think that that, um, you know, maybe has not been put to rest, but at least has been addressed in a, a couple of different ways. Um, and also I, you know, not, it's not a guarantee, but like just common sense would have it that, that the trucking, the trucks themselves are not gonna want to do that. They're gonna wanna go out to Payne Road and get immediately um, on the highway. This is not to say that they can't, and there won't be, you know, a, a, an occasional case of that. Um, but what I'm more interested in hearing about is um, for the cars. So, okay, so we're accommodating truck traffic at and through the intersection at Payne and Holmes Road, but presumably there will be some volume of traffic that diverts itself around that because they don't want to sit behind, you know, through these additional. Um, Cues. And so I'm curious if the traffic team has looked at any sort of different distribution of traffic around this area, like on roads, like Holmes Road. I know there's not a lot of other road options. I realize that. Um, but I'm just curious if that has come up in any of your analysis. No, it did not. Um, the numbers from all the analyses that we ran Again, the number of trips is small. We were showing no significant difference between no build and build conditions. So we wouldn't expect people to be trying to divert or find a different way. Um, again, the models and everything 
the extra 100 feet that were provided was more than I think the model said maybe it was going to extend by 40 feet. We proposed 100 feet in case you had two trucks at once, but that's not what is expected to happen. You're not expecting longer queues. We were seeing a one second increase in delay at the intersection, not enough to make people divert a different way. Okay. And did, did you, um, so again, that's truck traffic, but did you look at, uh, presumably you have employees that are coming to and from the facility? That's everything. That was that, looking that's at everything. everything. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Let's see. Um, thank you. That's helpful. Um, I'm chair, can I just jump in while she's looking at our next thing? Yeah. I just, maybe for the public too, I just wanted to point out, um, I think we all had a hard time kind of with the review of traffic and just uh, kind of straight face testing what we're looking at. Um, so not only is obviously their, their traffic engineers, our peer reviewer, really, we dug in deep. I would also like to point out, I think to the public that I reached out to DOT, not once, but twice to help mm -hmm. in this review and help make sure we're not in a traffic movement permit from the state level, because um, it just didn't feel set quite right at the beginning. Um, there's been a lot of conversations around traffic. This is not something that we dealt with lightly and we brought in anybody that we could to talk about it. And I think Anna can confirm that. Um, we, yeah, we um, tried to pull in every expert we could um, to try to make sure we kind of kind of kick the tires on this. Um, to your point though, I, I don't think we, we did bring up the diverting traffic and I am hearing people on Two Broad Road. Um, if vehicles are diverting and going down Payne onto Two Broad um, to get out to the West, I don't know if that would be significant enough um, to do any kind of offsite mitigation. That's where we're kind of struggling. Okay. Um, the last, my last question, and I apologize for jumping all over, but I've taken sporadic notes here. Um, my last question has to do with signal timings at Payne and Holmes Road, and maybe this is a better question for you or the applicant. I'm not sure. There was, you know, uh, information provided about um, lengthening turn lanes, radius changes. Maybe we saw, we heard or saw that at one point. Um, but also, you know, presumably with, and I don't have the existing, the current data, but I'm going by hearsay and emails here, which is we're hearing that there are delays out there. And, and we're, we're hearing that not just from this project, but actually from all the projects and some that aren't even close to there. <laughs> uh, so there's obviously a delay problem. I understand full well about uh, mitigation and catching up of trips and things like that. Um, but so I guess I'm curious, whether anyone is looking at the signal timing at that intersection in addition to some of the changes in geometry that we're looking at. And my thinking there is that um, larger trucks are gonna take longer to turn. And we're also proposing um, pulling stop bars back a little bit, which essentially increases the size of the intersection making everything take a little bit longer. So I'm just curious if anyone's looking um, at that or if these, uh, lane lengthenings and stop bar adjustments will will just straight add to the delays that are being seen there now. Um, I guess I can speak to it, and maybe Diana or Matt wanted to to jump in, but um, yeah, we were looking at the delays of that intersection and the downs. Although you might not know it right now because it's it's uh, not very visible, are actually in the middle of a project at that intersection. They're actually responsible for putting the adaptive traffic signal in and actually that will adjust the timing. So there'll be less maybe tweaking around the phasing of that intersection. Once that gets fully on board, um, it's, they're doing all the Payne Road intersections all through the mall area and South Portland, um, as well as this is intersection as well. So it will be an adaptive signal and it will hopefully see those platoon of vehicles coming at it. Um, I don't know, it's also an isolated intersection. Mm -hmm. I know it's on a corridor, but obviously you can speak to that better than I can, as far as it, it's not really seeing the timing coming at it. It's kind of a standing alone. The goal is that that would improve uh, over time. I think 
unfortunately it might get worse before it gets better because it needs to learn it needs to figure it out and there's multiple things coming at it right so right now we're dealing with costco traffic we're dealing with the downs and every new building coming on and the downs um i'm not sure the timing of fedex if that would be before or after maybe diane has, has spoken with coral palmer and that mm -hmm. timing and how that goes because i'm assuming with any of your your queuing lengths and things like that, you are looking at the timing, um, but I'm not sure. So I think there's gonna be multiple times that that signal is gonna have to be touched over the next year um, to try to address exactly what you're talking about. And so I feel like it's a work in progress. Yeah, I think it's definitely a work in progress. We used existing signal timings primarily. And one of the issues, if you recall, was the phasing change from the time that we initially did our first traffic study. The left turns were protected, permitted, and now they're protected only. So that creates more delay by not letting some of those left turns squeak through. Um, so I think there will be adjustments over time, but again, if it's adaptive, it's going to be changing as needed to best serve the most traffic that it can. Yeah, and I can speak to, we um, actually petitioned DOT about taking away the flashing yellow um, when we started seeing an increase of crashes in that intersection and started that, that started ramping up. So we took safety over delay in that instance. Um, and so kind of still working on that balance, I think. Okay. I just, you know, we're, we're all but being promised additional development here also that will undoubtedly funnel through the same intersection. So, um, this is just one piece of the puzzle. I recognize that, but, um, thank you for that information. That's all I have. All right, thank you. Um, I'm going to take a five. We will we will be taking a five minute recess, uh, and then and then returning. Um, I use that clock, at the back wall, to calculate five minutes. We are in recess. Thank you.
we are back in back in business. Uh, board comments. Who would like to go next? Oh, I see Jim's hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first off, I want to thank all of you uh, who have written in. I always make it a point to make sure you read each and every letter sent in. Um, I empathize greatly uh, as someone who grew up in a home with poor well problems and having clean drinkable water wasn't always a guarantee. Uh, I greatly empathize. Um, quick comment I wanted to mention it was brought up earlier. Um, I think they left, but hopefully they'll hear this afterwards. But regarding access to the site, Payne Road does not connect here. It's landlocked by I-95, Holmes Road, and Two Rod. Um, Worthy of note, this is the only light industrial in the town of Scarborough. Um, it's the only light industrial or anything related to it on this side, or the west side of I-95. Uh, I-95 is a great uh, demarcation in Scarborough. Uh, and the giant mass that is rural farm zone, mostly, with a couple of very small exceptions on that side of the highway, um, does not have public water or public sewer greatly spread throughout this zone. Um, it's mostly residential. Um, I have a couple of questions, but I guess I'll, uh, I guess a quick question, Matt Reynolds, if I could ask you real quick, if that's all right, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, so the well testing, when I looked at it, the water quality that was done, it's, it, it appeared to be okay to consume. Um, there were some levels of water height indicated, but I didn't see whether like an advisory opinion, if, um, if a deeper well, a drilled well or some other improvement to the wall would uh, address the water table concerns that was presented. Uh, and Matt, could you give me a sense of um, if, if Setzer were to go in and provide 200 foot drilled wells to each of the abutting pro you know, residential properties on two rod, would that make any difference to their uh, issues about water level? With respect to, excuse me, with respect to water level, um, you know, it would make the wells, they, those would be more robust wells with respect to drought conditions when the water table drops. No doubt, deeper is deeper is more um, resilient with respect to, there's, it's, it's not always quite that simple because if you go down into another part of geology, another rock, you might, you might have water quality issues. There's, there might be capacity issues. I mean, some, sometimes, you, you drill a well and it, you drill a deep well and it doesn't have much yield. The shallow wells work really well for that. Um, so it's, it's um, you know, in, in the very simplest terms, yes, if they were deeper, they would be a little more resilient, whether they would be better overall. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's a little hard to say definitively sure. one way or another. Yeah. Uh, on average, I know, this, this facility is looking at a 300 foot dug well or drilled well. Obviously, it's probably overkill for a single residential home on average. What do or do you have knowledge? No, I mean, it, that that depth is pretty typical for a lot of residential wells also. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the the, the um, sometimes you can drill less, you know, shallower and get adequate water. So there's a formula basically that says if you need X amount of water, you, you need to go a certain de depth and have a certain yield. Mm -hmm. And there's the main well drillers uh, have has basically a table that the well drillers use. And so for a single family residential home, they they need to go a certain depth. This one obviously because it would be, you know, more water, it would it would need to have a higher yield, and that that is a combination of the yield to the well and how deep it is, which is basically storage in that, in that well. Um, so it, it's a, it's a combination, but 300 feet is not unusually deep. And, and there are wells in the area that are, you know, are, have plenty of yield, other drilled wells in the area that have plenty of yield that makes us believe that there wouldn't be a problem with adequate yield for the well for this facility, but there's still a risk. I mean, they may, they may go in there and drill a well and it won't be sufficient. It would have to be deeper. It would have to be fracked. It would have to be something in order to, you know, that's true with any, any, any well. Understood. Uh, another question, would you have any 
ballpark budgetary price information on what it would cost for i know if, if, yeah. if you don't i don't know i'm I'm, okay. I'm gonna i'm gonna uh, i would quote you a price from back in the day sure and yeah. it would be way inadequate be so i'm not yeah, gonna go there that would be the smart answer as well so thank you i appreciate that i guess my question for uh, the applicant and does not need to be addressed at this very moment but um, I think I mentioned this in the July meeting, or at least in the May meeting as well, uh, if the applicant would be amenable to providing drilled wells for there are five or seven residents here that on this side, the uh, eastern side of Two Rod Road, they would be amenable to drill, providing drilled wells for these properties to address some of their water concerns. Um, thank you. I'm all set with you, Matt. Okay. I appreciate you. Um, Regarding the lighting, at two miles away, you can see Costco's parking lot light up the sky at night. And this is called Sky Glow. And this is mentioned in the lighting ordinance. Uh, sky Glow is the brightening of the nighttime sky that results from scattering and reflection of artificial light by moisture and dust particles in the atmosphere. Sky Glow is caused by light directed or reflected upwards or sideways and reduces one's ability to view the night sky. And This is why we have lower light pole heights that come into play here. And if you do want to have higher light poles, yes, you do have to apply for a waiver. You can apply for anything with a waiver here. Um, and if this site were right on Payne Road, there might be less concern with this location with regard to sky glow and lighting pollution. Um, looking at the lighting ordinance, all exterior lights that remain on during after hours must be dimmed to 50% of their total lumen output until 30 minutes before business reopens. Um, uh, this, this, and I'm looking to board members, this has to be a requirement for this property uh, due to the unique nature and character of the immediate neighborhood surrounding it. Um, and it's already been stated that this is a new, uniquely zoned space due to the abutting massive RF zone that's next to it. And there was no public water or public sewer available. Uh, when we were going through this application in May, um, we were not understanding the change in developers at that point, uh, we were looking at a nine to five operation with very limited activity at night, if anything at all, essentially somebody to stand guard and sort of watch the hen house while just to make sure nobody was in there. Um, seeing that, <clears throat> reviewing the comments uh, and indicating that this is indeed gonna be on-site operations occurring at night, on-site trucks driving around, uh, parking trailers, moving trailers, at such close proximity to the neighbors on True Road. And I greatly appreciate the efforts that are being done to, for the engineered berm and all of the, all of the trees that are being put in place. Um, it's still, there is still gonna be noise pollution and light pollution that's gonna be affected by these neighbors. So not only will your sight lights be on all night at this place, again, you can remember, you can see Costco in the sky two miles away. Um, there will be sounds of truck movement trailers hitching, unhitching, banging of trucks. If there's a new guy on site working a third shift that's learning their job, he's probably gonna bang into something. Um, this isn't, I don't find this suitable for this area. Uh, and, and for a space that only used to experience nighttime activity, limited nighttime activity, and there were fireworks at Beach Ridge and other things, but that would only be 46 or 48 nights per year that that went on uh, and it was done by the middle of the evening. Um, there, I mentioned this in May as well, you know, there needs to be an understanding by this applicant of, you know, the, the community impact. I mean, since this project came for us, um, there has been community feedback about this constantly the entire way. Yet I, I see very uh, little without us sort of hammering them down to, to try to get, um, to try to get something back from, from the client we finally have, which I deeply appreciate uh, ad adopting the Barton Little Judas uh, re road recommendations. But going back to my experience on the zoning board, whenever there was a small business or occupation that was to be put up in an area that's not typical, uh, one of the questions we would always ask is the traffic generated by such an occupation shall not increase the volume of traffic so as to create traffic hazard or disturb the residential character of the immediate neighborhood. Um, and I, I, for these reasons, uh, the sound generated by nighttime operations will disrupt the character of this neighborhood. Um, it's critical that while we as planners look at the 
these applications that come before us, but we're also planning for the impact of what this facility is going to have in this area as well. And we need to be looking at the neighborhoods around them, and this is going to disrupt and irrevocably change the character of this entire neighborhood in this area. Um, we've had similar discussions about light pollution before this past year, uh, the self storage units in North Scarborough. That was a, that was a major sky glow concern um, that that didn't didn't uh, that we use on that application there. Uh, also, to more recently, the rugby field project on Two Rod Road, and they're going to be abiding by our strict lighting policy that we that we instituted upon them. They're going to be shutting their lights off at exactly the time that we asked them to. Um, and I think it's critical that we that we address this here uh, and really look at how this fits in. Because um, as of right now, if this is going to be a 24-7 operation, uh, on the reasons of disrupting the character of the neighborhood through sky glow and noise generation and traffic, uh, uh, traffic movement, I, I can't support this. And if the board does eventually, I know there's another meeting with this, if the board does allow this to um, proceed forward, I would expect to see in strong support uh, strong restrictions on operating hours, lighting, uh, quantity of vehicles or trips allowed to and from the site. Because remember, um, this as soon as this application goes through, this is likely the last chance that we'll have to sort of have an interaction with this project or have, have a say in what kind of restrictions we can have on this property should it be allowed to go through. So we need to think about what 15, 10, 15, 20 years is going to look like in this area. And does this does this or does this not impact the character of the neighborhood? And again, I look back at uh, asking 50% lower light levels on the entire site. That's all I have, Madam Chair, at this time. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Rick Meinking. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think, uh, what is this, my sixth year on, on the board here, and this has got to be one of the most deliberated and talked about project that I can remember. And um, the comments made by by my fellow planners uh, ring true to me as well. Um, that lighting ordinance is fairly new. Um, we recently, inside of a, a year, put some really strong language in there for the purposes of light pollution and um, encroachment on on uh, abutters and so forth, and and bringing in the new technology. There's there's fantastic fantastic technology that will automatically reduce lumens, shut off light fixtures when there's no motion under them, uh, all kinds of things that can be done. And I fully support uh, the comments made by uh, my colleague James on on the lighting. Um, I also want to go back to the opening comments made by Madam Chair in that our job is to ensure that ordinances are followed and we are quasi-judicial and if we don't approve something and they want to, the applicant wants to rebut that, they have to go to the main Supreme Court. And that puts everybody in in a predicament. And so I'm just saying this uh, to to those that made thoughtful comments, both orally and written, um, before I cast my vote, which won't happen tonight, uh, I'm going to ensure that the ordinances are followed. And then this one other ordinance, the good neighbor ordinance, is also taken under consideration. So here's my ask from the applicant. I would like a presentation at the next opportunity that you're in front of us, listing all of the things that you are doing to ensure that this property or this operation fits into this neighborhood uh, in this particular area. I wanna know in bullet form, all of the enhancements you are doing to mitigate the issues that you have heard from the abutters and from others that are concerned about this project. 
And would you please prepare that so that it can be used in, in my delib deliberations with myself and in ensuring that if I cast a vote, I'm doing it with everything under consideration. So that's my ask. And uh, I will tell those that made the comments and are here tonight that I take this very seriously. And just because they meet the ordinances as defined in the light industrial and the plan development doesn't always end with that. There is a good neighbor ordinance. And I feel like that needs to be brought out a little bit more from the applicant because they're the ones that have to fit in. We don't have the people that are already living there need to fit in. You have to fit in. That's all I have, Madam Chair. Thank you. Ben? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'd like to echo some of the comments of my fellow board members to start. Um, and yet again, we'd like to thank the members of the public for all your engagement on this project. It's really important that you know, we hear these perspectives and, you know, it's, it helps us to figure out what, what can be done to improve your situation and the town's situation and everything. I have a couple of questions for the applicant. Um, can somebody uh, at least walk me through where the $250,000 number came from for the cost of future improvements? I don't know if uh, anyone here is best qualified to figure out you're moving the traffic lights, you know, what is the cost of moving one traffic light? What is the, where did that number come from exactly? Yeah, Sebagno Technics actually estimated it, but it was the cost to move two mast arms out of the way of a future widening, adding additional southbound three lane. So there are two mast arms that are in the way and also a traffic signal controller that was recently installed. So that's the cost to relocate two mast arms one of which actually has to be replaced because it would need to be longer. So that would include the replacement cost as well. Yeah, so replacement cost for one mast arm, relocating another one, and relocating the controller and reinstalling everything. Okay, but it has nothing to do with the actual road improvements that might be done in the future. That would be the responsibility. No, but we're paying the impact fees towards the actual road improvements. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. And I think that question is probably for somebody else, but I don't know. Um, Current condition of the stormwater uh, situation at Beach Ridge. Where does uh, could someone talk me through, and maybe for the public as well? Where does this current stormwater flow to, as is if nothing was done to this property? So the current stormwater patterns of the site are a mix of uh, infiltration through the the center field area within the track. Um, there are a couple of drains that are there, which pipe outfall to. Uh, man-made ditches, which are on the uh, northern and eastern side of the property. Um, and this so that's makes... on, on Holmes Road area? Um, towards Holmes Road? It, nope, it goes towards uh, between us and the, and the town's property. Okay. Uh, there's kind of the, the ditching that, that goes okay. around. Um, and then in addition to... The, so uh, Autumn just pulled it up on the screen here. Um, so the, the... Or Angela, sorry. Uh, the two areas we're, we're looking at primarily um, would be at what it's delineated on the, on the screen there. Um, yep. So the left-hand side of the paper um, all goes to where the darker outlines are, and those all go to um, what is a, a dug farm pond to the um, east, northeast of where the, the office building would be. Um, and... It goes there. There's some wetlands that um, go off site. Uh, as most people that are familiar with the area know, it's very flat through that area along Holmes Road. So there really is not a lot of um, roadside ditching or anything involved at all present day. Um, you know, heavy rainstorms, you can you can see the water still sitting on the parking lot on both sides of the roadway. Um, and yep. then it, it dissipates over time. Um, Does water get trapped in the middle of the uh motorway uh yes and no i mean there there's drainage infrastructure there to to not it, it doesn't just become a large yeah. pond it does seep into the ground and also go through those dry wells and and outfall through a culvert okay and then with your intended improvements um 
the water will be going to stormwater treatment plants on the or stormwater treatment facilities on the um, plan east side. Uh, it, some, oh, some. Um, yeah, so directional wise, north and south on the property, but yep. the the site is is designed to be split basically right down the middle, so <clears> that half of the development continues to go towards the direction where it flows today, which would be what is proposed where the gravel wetland is towards the rear of the facility. And then the other half flows towards the front, um, mimicking similar conditions today and going into an infiltration basin to again, recharge that groundwater. And that half of the water is moving, or we will be moving closer to the abutters properties then? Uh, no? Neither case. Neither case? No. So that pond there, right up, you know, on plan north above the abutters properties, is that is that not a sort of a stormwater treatment? Yeah. So the, the gravel wetland, the, yeah. the ultimate discharge and outfall of it does go north. to to the man-made ditches and in, in okay. the same same general flow direction. None of it's going. None correct. of it's going downwards. Yep. Okay. So then that wouldn't likely have any positive impact on the abutters. Uh, wells. Well, the 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 infiltration practices will recharge the groundwater. Um, Matt Reynolds can speak more to how groundwater and and that the like of that flows. But today, or or what we had to show is in the proposed conditions, we are not changing or altering uh, downstream characteristics. So mm -hmm. today, with the way the topography is. Uh, the land from the abutters does flow towards the landfill surface, surface wise, not talking groundwater wise. Um, so that is the direction that the water is flowing generally in what is in the proposed condition. <laughs> okay. So I guess really what I'm trying to get at is with, with the improvements being proposed as opposed to what's currently there, is it, would you say that there is uh not counting the well that you would be digging for uh, the property. Um, no impact, negative impact, or positive impact to the abutters wells. Is there any way to make a conversation about that? Uh, of the, the storm water? Yeah. Well, I mean, just recharging the ground groundwater in that area by the, by changing the structures. Um, you give an answer on whether it's negative, positive, or neutral? In, in engineering practicality, it should be positive in that these are treatment systems. Um, in today's, what is currently out there on site today, there is no treatment provided of stormwater runoff. Um, so all water that runs off from the site in that case is more of a net positive. Um, in, and there, by that positive, you mean both in water quality and in potential water table level or? Uh, and, and quantity and, and where it's located. I mean, I I don't study necessarily the underground flow, so I can't fully speak. I know uh, Matt Reynolds did provide a memo uh, in previous submissions, which did address concerns regarding uh, downstream runoff and infiltration um, and how that would be addressed in the groundwater. Um, exactly. Madam Chair, can, can I just ask a question that's piggybacking off what sure. I think Ben is saying. I, I guess a question back to Sebago. Looking at your details though, it looks like your un, your infiltration basins have a clay lining. Is that is that something you guys looked at? Is is trying to increase your infiltration to help with the wells or the groundwater system? Or maybe that's something Matt could speak to. Did was that factored into your stormwater management system, the infiltration piece? Um Clay, I, is the clay, i trying to remember the, recall the detail, but no, 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 you're okay. I'm curious if maybe you guys work together on the system you came up with, because it looks like from the detail, and maybe it's just a typical detail on the plan, and that's not what the intention was, so that's why I was asking if you guys kind of looked at it with the infiltration as part of, to, I think Bennett was trying to get at it, maybe there's some advantage of trying to get that water back into the groundwater table. Um, yeah, I mean, we definitely looked at it in the respect of infiltrations. It It's not a highly utilized practice, and it should be in, in most more cases um, across the state in general. Um, 
a lot of times we do a really good job as as engineers to direct all of our our runoff to a centralized pond um, which was what we had originally looked at in this design um, which then puts all of your flow into a net point and it all goes where we say it's going to go and it 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 would completely alter what the existing conditions of flow are today so we did look at it and to try to keep in mind with what today's um, surface runoff does show. So the infiltration practices were um, thoughtful in that respect. Um, I don't, I didn't work with Matt, I would say on necessarily a specific design of that uh, detail and system, but um, I, sure. Excuse me, just just to your question, Bennett. I think I think overall the stormwater um, infiltration piece is is certainly neutral and maybe somewhat positive and with respect to the current conditions, kind of in a big picture. So is that helpful? Um maybe another quick question. Maybe a history buff is here. When was Beach Ridge Motor Speedway constructed originally? You may know. 1949. Do we have any stormwater ordinances in 1949 in Scarborough? Yeah, the ordinance since 1949. We built a lot of pavement there, and I'm pretty sure we altered where the water was flowing in 1949. Just saying. So if we're trying to do a net positive or neutral, we may want to look at you know where the obviously we can't go back you know <clears throat> 70 years, but 75 years. Um, but I guess I kind of question with the. Uh, Maybe someone could speak to who's more wise than me on this topic, but why we want to continue the current water flow practices from a development that wasn't actually um, uh, met to a stormwater code in the first place. So just saying there may be a way to help with the water table levels with a little bit different configuration. I don't know if that's something that we can, I know there's a lot of project has been worked on, but that's something that, you know, maybe it could be a net positive that Setzer could bring to this site if there was a way to help, especially with the the uh, residents' concerns. So that's just a thought. Um, I, I guess to, to answer that, the so we are reducing the overall non-revegetated surfaces that are currently present on site today by over 10 acres with what is proposed in the full build out. Um, so that's 10 acres of area that is being either revegetated or being supplemented with the infiltration system or the gravel wetland. Um, in respect to peak rates, which is typically done, you know, we just have to uh, meet or reduce whatever today's standard are. And a lot of times you see as engineers, we come forward and we nail it by being a tenth under or meeting it and matching it right on this development with what's being proposed we actually reduced and and that led to a comment on why uh, matt reynolds had wrote his memo um, the peer reviewer you know spoke to we were reducing those peak rates by um, i believe it was almost 90 percent and they had large concerns over the that significant of a reduction so um with that said, I, I would say, you know, we've, we've done a really excellent job at, at mitigating any sort of issues that have come here and, and far exceeded what is required by, by the ordinance and both uh, the EP standards. Yeah, I, I understand that you're meeting the ordinances. I was kind of playing towards the good neighbor ordinance, but you know, if you could help improve, I don't know, or at least make the neighbors feel like they may have some improvement in their wells. Um, I have one more question and it's probably a different person back up now. <laughs> um, originally, someone was saying that there would be probably approximately one truck in the middle of the night. Um, that's what I've heard at one of these presentations before. Um, can someone clarify for me and the board and the public why one truck at night, if that's still the case, uh, meets 24 hours uh, need for full lights, or if there's some difference in how that's going to be played out now? Does anybody have a response for the plan for that. Thank you.
When we speak about 24 seven operation, it doesn't mean that we've got 24 seven truck movement. So even with trucks not moving, we're gonna have equipment on our yards and there's gonna be personnel that are there and we have to have that facility secure and well lit and that kind of thing to maintain those standards. So that may be what you're So there's people moving the small trucks around to move boxes from warehouse to or from spot to spot or, or I guess I'm kind of wondering about like the whole parking lot um needing to be needing to be lit who is uh who's moving around the parking lot of that you know in the middle of the night when there's not a truck there I mean there could be a single individual that is going out to a truck to make sure that it's locked or um you know checking hostlers or tra or tractors those are the kinds of things so there's going to be some level of activity just not particularly truck movement okay um I guess I'll I guess I'll uh I guess I'll stop here. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. All right, thank you. Um, my colleagues, I think, have done a great job of uh, highlighting some some questions that would be helpful if we had responses to uh, when you folks come back. Um, I've run this meeting a little differently than I have meetings in the past. Um, simply because I thought it was important to get as much information out as possible uh, to allow the, the public and the, and the board members uh, to gather as much information as they could so that they could make uh, an informed decision. And so the neighbors uh, would also understand um, some of their issues may have been answered and some may not. Um, so it was a little more casual than you than usual. Let me uh, uh, bring this to a screeching halt in a sense. Uh, one of the things that I was just reminded of by uh, the planning department, we've had a lot of conversations around the good neighbor ordinance. A good neighbor ordinance exempts OSHA noises and the good neighbor ordinance exempts properties requiring site plan review. So in basically the good, day, the good neighbor ordinance does not cover FedEx, this property. That doesn't mean that folks shouldn't, that SETSA should not try uh, to meet the requirements as much as possible. They're not obligated, but to me, being a good neighbor means you go beyond what you're obligated to do and try to uh, address the issues of those neighbors. Um, so I, I confess that I had missed that. Um, I am going to go back. I'm going to read the lighting ordinance again. I think uh, the board members um, have got some homework to do in terms of rereading ordinances uh, and taking a look at what we've required and what we still have hanging out there uh, for sets to take a look at. One of the things that I think my mind is hanging out there um, is the land uh, in back of the facility area um, and for conservation. Is there any opportunity to put all of that land into conservation? that would be a wonderful good neighbor uh, or a good neighbor approach. Uh, it would provide uh, the um, abutters with at least a, a sense that nothing else is gonna go back there, that whatever you see is what you've got. Um, I commend Setzer on the work that they've done in terms of decreasing the amount of I would call it hardened earth that was left over from the uh, um, from the speedway, a and the attempt to add uh, really some good uh, revegetation. They've done a lot of work in that area. Not all of it required. They could have tried to get away with less, but they have responded very much to. Um, our requests. We're not going to pass them tonight. They need to come back to us. 
they have, I think, uh, some work to do to take a look at how they can move towards a little more towards being good neighbors uh, with the understanding that it's not something they have to do, but it would be something that would be really good to do. Saying that, we have finished. Item, next item on the agenda is a minor development, is a staff report. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, at this time for uh, building permits and start of construction, the Higgins Beach Market has actually been mm -hmm. demolished and mm. um, is being reconstructed. Uh, certificates of occupancy, 48 Camden, that's the fourth apartment complex in North Village, and Patriot Accurate at Payne Road and Haggis received their CO. Our next that's meeting is start. November 18th. Hmm. Uh, minor development reviews, we do not have any currently. And administrative amendments, we do not have any in the pipeline currently. All right, how about correspondence? How about correspondence? You received it all today. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we did. Um, closing items, the uh, planning board comments. Any comments, Jen? Uh, I just, just have one. Um, we did receive a lot of public comment today about the project that we just discussed. And um, I know that there was at least one of those communications that uh, reference and had copied uh, Councillor Anderson, but my take on reading a lot of them, and it was very thankful as I knew that you would, um, that you pointed out, sort of re re-emphasized our role and um, duties as a board and what that is and what it is not. But it seemed like there was a lot of um, information or at least sentiment in a lot of those communications that are probably more appropriate for the council. And so if they don't normally get copied on those, I just wondered if they could get these forwarded to them. <laughs> they actually do have them. And we okay. took this, uh, the light industrial zoning district up in long range planning committee last week. Uh, and they have requested some language change come back. So um, in November, we'll be talking about that again as well. Okay, great, thanks. Board, additional board comments? Jim? I just wanna say thanks staff for being awesome and doing really well tonight with all the challenges and everything. So thank you. Uh, I would like to uh, second, third and fourth that. Um, this was a, difficult meeting as we knew it was it was going to be. There's a lot of emotion behind this. Uh, some things we can do something about and some things we can't. Some things don't belong in our purview. Uh, other things do and sometimes it's not easy to separate them. But as I, as I said, I felt that the more information, the more discussion, the more people could hear, the more transparent we were about responses and hearing from the, the applicant, uh, the better off we were in the long run. I don't know if we've changed any minds um, of the people who don't like the project, but may, they may understand what's next, what our role is, uh, what we have to do, what we look at, and how we make decisions. Uh, and that in itself, in, in effect, is a, a civics lesson. Uh, and it is um, it is important that we do that now and then. So saying that, do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. I've, I've got uh, Jen Jen's hand beat you a finger there, Roger. Uh, <laughs> or you may you may second it. Do I hear any objections? No objections. We're adjourned. Thank you.